Hey folks, welcome back to another review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today we're taking a look at this big box right here. AMC's The Walking Dead No Sanctuary, the board game. Yes, that is a mouthful, but there is also a box full of game here. So we are going to take a look at it. This is coming from the Sadler Brothers and Cryptozoic. So uh, that may strike your fancy or not if you've liked their games in the past. Uh, the theme... Really does kind of ooze here, so that's a good thing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to go over, though, so let's get down to the table. We'll take a look at how it works, and then we'll come back with some final thoughts in just a few moments. So let's get to it. Each player is going to take their deck of survivor cards and shuffle them and then draw three cards to start the game with. They're also going to take one trust token uh, to begin the game with and then one person is going to be uh, considered the leader and so we're going to have Glenn be the leader uh, to start off the game. Now, uh, every person does have a survivor ability as well. Uh, this one says for Glenn, once during his or her activation, a survivor may discard one of your survivor tokens to move one space. And that leads me to the survivor tokens. Everybody has their own stack of survivor tokens. Uh, you take all of them and put one of them over here on the group page because you're going to be trying to accomplish some of these events. And uh, you'll to if you do one of the events, you'll you'll have your survivor token over here to denote that you did carry that uh, out, whatever it might be. But the rest of them are just placed here. Some of the cards in the deck here will be able to you'll be able to give these survivor tokens uh, to other people, and once they use them, or, or rather once they have them and they still have a trust token on their sheet then they'll be able to discard it and use your special ability in this case you'll be able to move one space uh, free basically. Now this is a scenario based game and you'll have a scenario sheet that tells you how to set up everything at the beginning of the game and then on the other side it is your the objective side of the, of the uh, scenario where you're going to be keeping track of everything that's going on. Now while we're on that note how you do how do you win or lose uh, basically if you run out of event cards before completing uh, your final objective on the scenario sheet you lose. If one of your survivors dies then you also lose. One other way that the uh, group can lose is if your morale gets all the way down to zero, which isn't uh, a difficult thing to accomplish, actually. It's pretty easy uh, to lose morale in this game, so you do need to keep an eye on that. Um, and if you accomplish the fourth objective before any of one of those things happens, then you've won. Now the game is played in a number of rounds and in each round there are five phases. In the planning phase is where uh, one, everybody's going to be drawing one card from their deck and adding it to their hand. Of course they start with three, so at the beginning of the first turn you'll have four cards that you can play out of your hand. Then the leader is going to take two event cards from the top of the deck and look at them secretly. Now, these are events that are going to happen. He can choose to neglect one of these, and the other one becomes the active event. If he chooses to neglect this, uh, for example, if he chooses to neglect taking inventory, each survivor suffers one stress for each resource pool with no resources. So that would be pretty bad because that means everybody would suffer two stress. Maybe you don't want to do that one. Well, the, the neglect one here says each survivor who is outside must either discard one trust or raise the threat by one. Uh, as bad as that might seem, we're gonna go ahead and do that one because this one is really bad. So this would be put in a discard pile, having carried out that neglect phase, and then this becomes the active event. And it says, after performing a search action, a survivor may gain one trust. So if somebody is able to uh, perform a search action, they're going to be able to gain one trust. Now, the other thing about the active things is that if nobody does this, then the, the leader is going to have to take a stress because he's choosing the approach that the team is going to take for this round. And if nobody does that, if nobody complies with them, then it causes them some stress. So this gets put right here. That allows us to exit the planning phase and go into the survivor phase where starting with the leader, they will be able to take a look at their hand of cards. Now, as you can see, their player cards also have colors that match the colors of the event cards because, as we said earlier, uh, there, you can either comply or uh, defy the approach that the leader has chosen for the group. If you defy, then you're going to cause the leader one stress. But if you comply, nothing bad happens. So Glenn is going to go ahead and choose this card right here to play as his uh, action. He is uh, coordinating with 
uh, his own approach, so that's good. Now, after he has played a card, you get to choose to do one maneuver and one action. Maneuver can be anything from moving, which you, uh, allows you to move two spaces orthogonally, or you can stand up if you've been knocked down. So if a zombie attack had knocked you down previously, you can use a maneuver to move and stand up. You can also hide, which reduces the threat level by one. Uh, and then if there are no enemies in your space, you'll also be able to discard one stress token uh, that you may have accumulated during the course of the game. Additionally, you can focus, which means you don't do anything. You just simply gain one focus symbol, which can be helpful. We'll talk about why later on. And then you can also use resources. You can perform a resource maneuver, which right now we all have, uh, because of the scenario staying, we start with five materials, and they can be used to build barricades. Glenn is just going to move one in here like this. And then he's also going to perform an action of search. So he's going to choose an interaction, which is this right here, which means that he's going to get two dice because that's the number that's here. Then he's also going to be able, he's going to have to take uh, black dice uh, for every stress that he has. He doesn't have any right now. And then if there are any walkers in his zone, he'll also have to take a black die for that as well. There aren't any, so he just has to roll his two dice. So he rolls them and he's looking for the check mark symbols and he didn't get either of them. Now, what we could do here, if we had a focus token in our supply over here, we would be able to use that to change this focus symbol into a, a success. But because we didn't have one of these, he wouldn't be able to do that on this turn. But for every symbol that you don't use, uh, you do get to take a token for future use. So that is cool, but he won't be able to take one of these search cards, and he also won't be able to uh, uh, finish this. He'll have to rely on somebody else to do that. Now, why would you want to be searching? Well, search searches have a number of different things in them. They have food, they have ammunition, they have materials and stuff like that. And then you also have some cards in these search decks that are ambushes, where you, you stumble upon a walker in one of the buildings that you're searching. Uh, basically, food can be used as a maneuver action to heal too, uh, which is important here because your deck is your health. If you ever run out of cards on your deck, you're dead. Uh, which means that the game is over and everybody loses. Uh, so having food is, is important. Ammunition is a maneuver action where you can discard an ammunition and raise the threat level by one to defeat one walker within line of sight. So for example, if, if Rick was here and we had uh, an ammunition over here, he would be able to discard it and knock out this guy right here because it's within line of sight. And then materials, as I already mentioned earlier, uh, is going to be used to be uh, building barricades in your space. And barricades are important because they will restrict movement for walkers and, and so forth and so on. And after everybody has taken their turn in the survivor phase, we move on to the event phase where we first of all check to see if any special rules are in play. There are no special rules for the beginning scenario, but then we also check to see if the active event has been taken care of by somebody. Andrea was able to accomplish it, so Glenn won't be getting a stress token this time around. And then we move into the walker phase where, first of all, all ready walkers will be activated. Now, they're activated in a number of different ways depending on the situation that is there. Right now, since there are no walkers that are adjacent to where humans are and there are no walkers in spaces, the only thing that the walkers are going to do is shamble, which means that they're going to move toward the nearest human space. All right, so uh, when you are determining, for example, you this, these people here could go one, two, three, four, or they could go one, two, three, four, and since they're equidistant, you have to use a map tile to determine which space they, which way they move. So since it is a uh, lateral movement here, these guys are going to move here. Uh, this guy is just going to move forward one like so. These people down here, because uh, the, of these guys right here, they're just going to move one space toward them as well. Same thing with these guys here. And uh, for those guys down there, they are also equidistant, could have two different directions. They're going to move this direction like so. Now, if there were a guy that was in a space with humans, then he would perform an overrun, which means that he's going to hit one of these guys to knock him down, which means that this guy has to exert, which means losing a card uh, from his hit points, basically. And then the walker would be placed face down, denoting that he has been activated. Now, if he were adjacent here, he would simply swarm, which means he would move into the space and then lie down because to also, again, to denote that he has been activated. 
After all of the ready walkers have been activated, now we add new walkers to the field, which we also use the map here. But we have to go to the uh, threat track here. So we have a threat track. We're going to be adding one uh, regular walker because the space is yellow here. And that regular walker is going to go into this area right here, denoted by the map symbol. So one person is going to show up here. And then we take and reduce this threat by one. Now we're in a red area, which means we're going to uh, be adding a special walker, uh, which is a gas mask walker for the opening uh, scenario here. And when they move into a survivor space, each survivor has to suffer one stress because they're a little bit more difficult to take care of. So that uh, special walker is going to go uh, up here like so. And then we move the threat down again. Another regular walker is going to be added, uh, let's see, right here. And then the last walker here is going to be added right in here like this. So then we move on to the objective phase and we check to see if we have accomplished the objective that is here. Uh, Careful Sweep says if at least one survivor is outside, resolve group tension. Well, we have two people outside, so we do have to resolve group tension. What this means is it's uh, uh, we we're, we're have to discard a trust token Everybody has to do that, and if we do, nothing happens. But, but if everybody can't discard a trust token, or if they don't want to, then that's going to lower the morale by one. So since we do have two people outside, then we do have to resolve group tension. We're just gonna go ahead and take the hit to morale right now. Then we look to see if, uh, if each survivor is in a building with at least one barricade, advance the objective. Well, uh, we have two that are in a building with a barricade, but these two aren't, so we don't accomplish this objective, uh, so we would not be able to advance. And then at the end of the objective phase, the leader can, he doesn't have to, he can discard a trust token so that he can pass the leader uh, to the next person in clockwise order. Now, uh, why would you want to do that? Well, maybe he has accumulated a lot of stress and he doesn't want to uh, gain any more stress. Uh, now, on that note, if he has been fully stressed out where he has three stress markers on his character board, he must pass the leader on because he's just done. He's stressed out. Somebody else needs to take over. But after that has been taken care of, we go back to the planning phase and we start another round of combat. And that's how the game continues until, as we said earlier, one survivor dies, ending the game. The morale track reaches zero, ending the game and defeat. Or the event deck is has been depleted, ending the game and defeat. Or having a victorious sweep of all of the objectives, in which case the party wins. So as you saw in the uh, playthrough part of it, this has a very large footprint. Uh, it takes up pretty much most of the table. Uh, we've got a you know pretty big Rathskeller's table here, and it takes up the at least half of the playing surface. So there is that, something you need to contend with. This may or may not fit on your kitchen table. You might have to find something a little bit bigger uh, to play this game on, but there is a lot of stuff in this box. Now the first pro of the game is I think that they've captured all of the characters that are in this uh, pretty well as far as their character abilities and the decks that they have and the different kinds of things that you can do with those cards uh, with the uh, survivor decks. I I like that a lot. I like the fact that they have uh, captured the character's essence uh, from the TV show. Now, that's one thing I guess I need to mention as well. This is based on the TV show, not the comic books. And of course, you probably saw that uh, because of all of the artwork and everything that's in the game already. So I think that they've done very well at incorporating the feel of the characters into the game. And then on top of that, I think the... Uh, psychological drama that the TV show is really known for is represented well with the different stress tokens and the focus tokens and, and all of that kind of stuff and how they interact uh, in the game. So I think they've, they've put together a very thematic experience here, which is good. If you like the TV show, I think that you're really going to enjoy this game. Another pro about the game is that they chose not to use screenshots, and I think that's very pivotal here because it would have been very simple for them to do it. There is a plethora of, of pictures and uh, clips out there that they could have easily used, but they chose to go with 
photorealistic artwork, which is pretty cool in my opinion. I like the fact that you can tell exactly who these characters are. The artwork is done very well. Uh, but it's not a screen cap or it's not um, a, a still photo, you know, that uh, they've used from the TV show. It's all artwork and I really do enjoy that. Another pro of the game is that it is rather simple to play. This is not a uh, over convoluted game. There isn't a whole lot going on and it's very structured uh, because you do this and then you do that and then you do this and, and it just kind of clips along after a while. But uh, that will also lead me into my first con of the game. And the first con of the game is uh, the rule book. I just didn't like how the rule book was laid out. It's not necessarily that it is a bad rule book, all of the information is there. I just didn't like how it was grouped together. Uh, because you would have uh, rules talking about doing this and doing this and this, and it would say, and if this happens, you do this. But the rule for that is later on. So you'd have to flip over and, and find and read that, and then you could flip back. Uh, so that was a bother for me. Uh, I don't think that uh, it's going to be a huge problem for everybody. It's not a horrible rule book. I just didn't like how it was laid out and how it was put together. It just didn't flow very well for me. A second con for the game is that setup is a bear. Uh, it just takes a long time. We're talking probably 15 maybe 20 minutes to set up the game, uh, especially if it's your first few times. Maybe it'll it'll uh, scale down after you've played a few games and, and it'll it'll be a little bit more intuitive at that point. But boy, it, it there is a... And, and the reason it takes so long is because there's so much in the game that you have to account for. So I really say this, that uh, setup is a bear because there's so much in the box, which isn't really a bad thing as far as you getting your money's worth, uh, but it is kind of a bad thing because it does take a good chunk of time to set the game up. And really that's about it. As far as cons are concerned, I, I, I didn't hate the game. I didn't really even dislike the game. I just thought that there was a little... Uh, it was just a pretty difficult to slog through the rule book for the first couple of times, and, and that always puts the game off a little bit for me. Uh, at first, I was <clears throat> having difficulty with how much stress everybody was going, and then I, I realized that I had missed a rule about how you can actually hide, and uh, that will lower the threat, and I just missed this part of it also get rid of a stress because you're hiding. Uh, so there's little mistakes that I made throughout the course of the game that, that really kind of soured it and I wish I hadn't uh, made those mistakes. I just thought it would, would be better if it was a little bit more intuitive as far as the rule book is concerned and it just wasn't for me. Maybe other people are not having that problem. So all in all, I think I'm gonna give this a seven out of 10. Now, and seven out of 10 seems high, but it's very, very close to being like a 6.5 or, or even just a six. It really depends upon the group that I'm playing with. But the reason I'm giving it a seven out of 10 is because out of all the Walking Dead games that I've played, and I've played a few of them, they were pretty much just variations about on other games and some of them were just not good games at all. Uh, this is the best Walking Dead game that I've played thus far. Now I haven't played all of them, I think, so take that for what it's worth. But uh, this is a, a fun game to play that captures the theme and uh, psychological drama that the TV show has in it very well. So if you like the show, as I said before, you're probably going to enjoy this game. Uh, just be aware that you might have to read the rule book a few times to get everything grokked and uh, together in your mind before you, before you uh, step out on your first adventure there. So that's it for me. 7 out of 10. I do enjoy the game. I think it's uh, one of the best Walking Dead games that's out there. Uh, but again, has some of its quirks and uh, difficulties as well. Uh, so that's it from me. See you guys and gals on the flip side. Take care.